but unfortunately we have to do it remotely. It's the first time we do <clears throat> a remote uh, workshop like that, so I hope it goes smoothly. If there are any issues, uh, I apologize in advance. Um, so as we wait a little bit for more people to sign up, um, I'll just, uh, I don't know how familiar people are with the, with the platform, but you can use, uh, we, we think it's a be better idea to use the discussion forum just to write anything you want. Uh, and if someone is present, for example, if I'm presenting uh, Peter or an, uh, someone else from the uh, people we have on board are going to monitor this and maybe uh, ask your question. Um, and if you have a, we have a, we have a number of tutorials like uh, hands-on tutorials, uh, which is a little bit hard to do uh, online uh, without having helpers actually there. But if you have a technical problem, uh, you can ask at the live Q and A, and then um, uh, someone, uh, one of the people we have here to help, uh, uh, is going to. Um, get your ticket and, and, and try to help you. Um, we Yes, we will share the materials after the session. Uh, you'll have your, we'll, you'll have all our slides and uh, all the um, tutorials, like all the code from all the tutorials. Um, okay, so we are at 42 people. I think we can start with the introduction and then uh, as people sign sign up, uh, okay. Definitely. So as I said, yeah, I even okay. see six to seven people. So we definitely. Oh, start. I see forty people. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> we can we can still start. <laughs> we okay, can still start. So, uh, but, but, yeah. Uh, I might reiterate, if you have any question, either technical or you don't understand something, like don't sit there alone, ask the question at the forum. We have here like four fantastic helpers that will uh, answer directly if it's the technical question. And if it's something like the general, we can't promise we uh, answer everything, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible. <laughs> okay, so, um, Using deep learning for image and sequence analysis. This is our title. Uh, okay, so we 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 don't have obviously it's a three hour workshop. We won't have time to uh, go into depth about everything. Uh, our goal today is to, if you are a beginner, uh, give you a kind of basic understanding of what is deep learning. Uh, give you resources where you can go and and uh, and find uh, more in depth uh, resource to 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 learn more about it. And we're going to have two basic applications: one about training models on image data, uh, and one about training models on sequence data, like biological sequences. Um, so. In our lab, we mostly work with the genomic data, so we mostly work with sequence data, uh, but we decided to include image data as well because this is a very, um, uh, it's, it's a big field in machine learning uh, and, and people might be interested in it. Um, okay, so this is kind of what we will do today. Um, this, uh, Workshop is based on uh, and will use the fast AI uh, Python package. It's uh, fast AI um, is a research group um, that uh, you know was developed uh, was founded a few years ago, and they are developing tools for uh, deep learning. Uh, very recently, like um, I don't know, like less than a, or maybe a week ago. Uh, they published their new version 2.0, which we will be using um, of their package. And there is also, I put here a link on for for the um, for their book that is really good, and for a really in-depth, really good in-depth course 
uh, that is freely available on YouTube. So if you like what you see here, you can go there and learn really, really how to do um, many of the things that this uh, package allows. So this is what we will be using. Um, okay, so what is deep learning it's in the title? Um, deep learning is a subfield of a subfield of machine learning. So machine learning, very briefly, is um, a science or a field of science uh, of computer science that is teaching, uh, trying to teach uh, machines um, how to do various tasks such as classification, uh, generation, whatever. Uh, now, a subfield of this machine learning is uh, neural networks, uh, which is a field that uses uh, networks of, of some things we will explain in the next slide that are called neurons. Uh, and you can see kind of uh, traditional neural networks uh, up here, different architectures of neural networks. And deep learning specifically or deep neural networks um, is a subfield of this that is uh, kind of coming, uh, becoming very popular in the last 10 years uh, where um, you have neural networks but with many, uh, many more uh, layers of neurons than what was traditionally um, thought as be best practice. And um, these, uh, it, outside our science, these uh, deep uh, neural networks are used extensively in the last five to 10 years um, uh, for uh, image uh, or video recognition, uh, self-driving cars, um, tra uh, translation, probably on your phone, you, you have a Google Translate that uses uh, face recognition, making art, playing games, whatever. Like there's many, many, many applications that have revolutionized their, their fields. Um, so what made deep learning possible uh, very briefly is the availability of big data sets that we have now that maybe we didn't have you know, uh, many years ago before the uh, data explosion that happened the past decade. Um, hardware advances like GPUs, uh, graphics cards becoming much cheaper and also dedicated hardware like TPUs that are uh, hardware like cards that are specifically made for, um, for, for deep learning or for machine learning. And also, of course, the field grew and there, were, there has been a lot, uh, many developments in finding smart ways to counteract some of the, some of the problems that, uh, that have been found along the way, making deep learning, uh, let's say, a, viol a viable or even a revolutionary uh, uh, method or, or set, of, set of methods in many fields. Um, it's just a small historical background. In our field, gener I know it's, a, it's kind of a big field, but uh, what, and uh, definitely this is not an exhaustive list, there's hundreds of papers on, on deep learning applied in biology uh, or biomedical sciences. Um, there have been big advances in the 3D modeling of proteins, uh, imaging, is a big field uh, finding, uh, for example, tumors or, or uh, abnormal uh, tissues in, uh, from, from scans. Uh, and in uh, genomic data, uh, using sequences to find genetic variants or um, predicting binding between RNAs and uh, RNA proteins, annotating genes, uh, this type of stuff. Um, so if you have uh, any uh, applications, uh, like if you work in, in this type of fields, you might see something or you might uh, soon read something uh, that use deep learning in your field as well, or you might write something that does it. Okay, so in general, um, when it comes to what, what we are mostly going to talk about here uh, is uh, supervised machine learning which means that we have um, very, very, very generally, um, we have a set of uh, samples, examples, 
with the with with the variable y that we want to predict, and uh, this uh, can be, for example, a value. Uh, it doesn't matter. And then we have a number of other variables, uh, a, a number of values x, which combine together in some way. Uh, we want to combine them together in some way. Um, use some different parameters to combine them so that they will estimate the value y. Um, our prediction uh, that uh, we usually write as y hat or y, y prime, um, the, the difference between our prediction and the real value uh, we call loss or error. Lo but loss, uh, I think, will use throughout this presentation. Uh, so our goal, our final goal in this uh, situation is to, to minimize the loss of, of our prediction. So find the optimal parameters with your input to minimize the loss. Um, as a very simple, um, like uh, a very simple first step, uh, you can think of something like a linear regression. So you have uh, one uh, variable coming in, one para one uh, x, uh, which is um, multiplied uh, according, uh, or, or the y will follow uh, this type of um, function. So you have two parameters. You have uh, the, the intercept and the slope of the of this curve, and um, this uh, this is a very easy. Uh, thing to, to predict. You can actually, we have a live, uh, an, a, a very simple uh, Excel uh, form that you can use. Uh, Peter, do you want to show it? Yeah, I'll give it a try. Okay. So I share my okay. screen. So, so yeah, share your screen. Uh, uh, you need to unshare before I can, yep. uh, before I can share. Okay. So um, let me do the whole desktop. It will work. Okay, let me go to the no, not here. I have to try right to one. um, it's your last, uh, yeah, here it is perfect. So, um, it's a penguin data. So it's, it's real data, it's measurement on the penguins, and we have the flip lengths, that's basically what we measure, that's, that's our variable x. And we try to predict body mass. And, you know, because it's so simple, you can even like do it in the Excel. So you have two parameters to control because we try to, to do it in the linear regression. You, uh, as uh, Panos wrote um, equation, y equals uh, m uh, times x plus b. So you can, you have one parameter bias or, or intercept the b and the slope m. So if you look like what we have right now, we have the predicted body that will change every time I change, you know, some parameters. So currently our estimate is pretty bad. You can see that the square error is, is like horrible. And this line of the uh, red red dots that are the predictions are very far from the this blue cloud and and this idle idle fit. So how would you do that? How would you do that if you would know nothing about statistics and mathematics and you be, you will be ten year old kid? You would fiddle about that. You would see okay, what would happen if I would put there not minus forty but but forty? Okay, something happens, and bias, I don't know, zero. Okay, and now you can, you know, you can slightly change the parameters. You can, looks okay, so if bias would be minus 10, would it be better or, or worse? I have the loss in this, like, orange box, so if I would change it to minus 10, huh, no, I don't know, maybe minus 10 is, not enough for me to see anything, so minus 10,000. Okay, uh, it actually grows, so that, that might be 
too much, so a thousand minus thousand, you know, and you can slightly fiddle about that. So minus thousand is maybe not enough, minus two thousand, still not enough, minus three thousand, you know, and, and you can see that your loss, your mean square error, uh, that, that is basically the sum of all, all square errors is going down. And you can slightly fiddle about those numbers, like, okay, if I don't do the 40, but 41, will it be better or worse? And, and so on, as long as you will get exactly uh, the perfect line. It, it might sound like very nice solution, but that's in a way what the neural network is doing. The only difference is they kind of know like which direction they should go instead of like randomly trying some numbers, what I've been doing here. Okay, Panos, that's everything on my side and I'm stop sharing the screen and you can continue. Panos, we can hear you. Yep, yeah, I'm back. Okay, uh, yeah, so this is basically the same, the same thing you see here. And if you if you plotted these two parameters uh, and the error, like if you you know just did a, uh, a grid of many possible parameters, you would see that the error kind of in this case simple case uh, has a, a global minimum somewhere here. And uh, if you were very good at playing this game and 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 always choosing towards the right direction, you would slowly move down. Uh, the right parameters and find the the, the optimal solution here. Um, so, oops, okay. So, um, of course, nobody wants to do this by hand, especially when you have bigger bigger questions. So here we will introduce the idea of uh, a single uh, single neuron uh, that can solve this this problem that you see that you saw. Uh, so a neuron is essentially a mathematical function uh, that takes as input uh, a series, a, a number of um, inputs. Uh, here they are uh, x1 to xm. In our case, we only had one x, so it would be x1. Um, a number of parameters uh, that are weights. So each one of these x's is multiplied by a weight, um, and then they're all summed together, and then uh, and then a final constant. Uh, it's also a parameter. A bias is added to the to this summation, and then this thing um, predicts a, a, a value. So the the question here is, um, can we can we find the the optimal uh, weights and bias? So the optimal parameters in order to minimize the loss of of uh, uh, this uh, this um, uh, example and. Uh, so your your first uh, real coding example is going to be a single neuron, as I explained. You can um, uh, go to this uh, uh, address. Oops. Um, and uh, I guess Peter is going to show you the. Um, Okay, I'll take over. Uh, could so. you keep yeah. the slides for a minute? But don't stop. Oh, too late. Oh. Never mind. I'll I'll do it on my side. So um, okay. So I hope you can. No, that's not what I want. I want the present button. Okay. I hope you can see this again. So we will work with the Google Collaboratory. I have just put the the question whether you know the environment or not. But even if not, it's like very similar than the Jupyter Notebook. So if you have ever worked with the Jupyter Notebook, you could be more or less fine. Maybe some shortcut is not working. And we will be showing like uh, uh, 
uh, using PyTorch. So that's another word that I should explain. It's the Python library for, um, for deep learning. We can train one neuron and basically solve the same thing as we have been solving with the, uh, with the Excel sheet a minute ago. Okay, so I'll, I'll go to this. So if, if you click the link uh, or if, if you retype it, you probably can't click it like me, but it's, it's very short. It's bit.ly slash and uh, the name of this conference, ECCD 2020. You will get to our GitHub and on our GitHub, you have the link to the slides uh, and you have the link to all the uh, all six exercises we will be do doing today. The first one is very easy and simple. Uh, we just want to demonstrate like how, how easy it is with with the neural network doing something like that. Okay, if you have never uh, been working with Cola before, uh, you might, uh, when you first click through, get some, uh, some question like whether you authorize Cola to, I don't know, connect your Google account, say yes. Uh, also, if you've uh, run the first cell, you will get the warning because the collab is mostly run by Google on his TensorFlow examples. So please click run anyway. If despite that it's not working for you, then ask the question at the forum because we will be using collab for a half of this course. So if, if you like stuck now, then you will be stuck for the rest of this tutorial. Okay. So what we are doing, uh, the collab is coming with the, mostly with the pre-installed libraries, but unfortunately, as, as Panos mentioned, the fast AI 10 days ago switched from uh, version one dot something to version two dot zero, and those two versions are not compatible. So uh, we would rather like install it manually. So uh, the, in the setup phase, we just install the library and we just do the basic imports. That's all what I'm doing, I guess already for the second time. I generate some random data, uh, you know. So uh, two random variables that are pretty much correlated. So this is what I'm trying to predict. Uh, and this is my loss function. So I define that the loss between the Y, so the true values and Y hat, those are predicted values, is Y hat minus Y, so the difference. Uh, this is in Python um, to the power of two. And I'm taking not here the sum, but the mean of this. And I'm starting with some random values. Okay, I should run it if I will not run it. It will not work, so I defined my loss function. I start with some parameters, so the, I believe this is the slope minus one and the bias one. Uh, you might never see in the word tensor before, and for the moment, just imagine NumPy array. So this is basically nothing else than the NumPy array, or if you have never seen even the NumPy array, then think about the list. Uh, this is the matrix multiplication in, in PyTorch. So it's like uh, this, this X, this, this is the X. So the first column will be multiplied by the first element of A that is minus one. And the second column will be multiplied by, uh, by one. And it gives us, you know, some mean square error. It's pretty high. Uh, and this will make the plot. So the blue dot, is what we have. The orange dots are our predictions and they are pretty bad. That doesn't matter, we can basically start anywhere. So uh, this is, you don't have to like fully understand that I'm just walking you through the code uh, to get some idea how that works. Uh, this is, we are telling the, the PyTorch that A is not just some numbers, but it's parameters, we want to learn it. So you can see when we will do it. So we have the value, but we also have some, uh, some additional information. And this is basically our, our update function. So as I was saying, like 
we will not get the solution immediately. We will be like fiddling a bit, and this is kind of telling how we should fiddle. So we are telling that our prediction is multiply x by mat matrix multiplication by a. We are, uh, our loss function is this mean square error. If uh, it's every 10th iteration, we would like to print the loss. And, there, and that's basically all. Uh, so, yeah, the, the rest is just, you can ignore the rest. The, the, this is just some like standard stuff. And, and basically the PyTorch is doing the fiddling with the number ar around us because we have said him, okay, loss is what we are interested. Try to fiddle in a way, then the loss would be going down. Okay. And if we basically do it a thousand times, we can see that our uh, our parameters are now three and something like two. And if we plot it, we've got almost perfect fit. Okay, that's basically all the rest is just if you want to see the process as the animation. Yeah, taking some time because I guess it's a thousand steps of the animation. And now if I will make it, you can see it that almost in the middle we are, we are already there. Okay, uh, Panos, do you see the forum? Are there any questions about this example? Or should we go further? Okay. Uh, I would reiterate like for the, the, the other examples we would like explain more into deep. Here we just want you to to show that it's very easy to, uh, to implement linear regression with PyTorch. That's all. Okay, great. Um, I'll just share. Okay. Um, so you saw how a single neuron works for a simple uh, like linear regression uh, question. Um, now I will give you some very basic overview of some terms that we're going to be using and some general ideas so you get a, an insight about how this works. If you are experienced or have a functional knowledge of uh, machine learning, you probably know all of these things, but it's good to, to, to give them uh, even for some beginners that are here. So pretty much everything we do or uh, we showed here uh, starts with the, um, uh, as we saw a, a, a neural net, neural network uh, that takes in some input data and some weights or some parameters, uh, creates a prediction. Uh, then this prediction is compared to the real thing. Uh, you get a loss, uh, loss uh, based on a function, loss function. So you get a loss value. Then through a process that you don't really need to know at this point, um, this loss uh, drives the, uh, an, uh, an update of the weights so that it, minima it becomes less. And then um, when these weights are, mini uh, uh, are changed again, uh, they're fed into the neural network again, maybe with the same input data or different input data. And then this loop continues until you have uh, the end of the, uh, you have some, you reach some end of, of this uh, process. Uh, now, um, three terms that you will maybe hear today and you might not know. Uh, an epoch, uh, uh, sorry, first of all, uh, when, we, when we talk about data, like I said, input data, uh, et cetera, Normally what we have is we have a data set of some sort, like all, all, all of our examples, uh, all of our samples. And we usually uh, would want to break this data set into three parts. Um, the first part is the training set and is uh, what is used here as input data uh, to, to, to do this, this prediction. The second part uh, of, the, of, the, of the second part is the validation set. Uh, which is um, 
what is, what is used uh, as we run several um, several uh, different, slightly different uh, networks. Maybe we're trying to figure out the best way to do something. We can use the validation set uh, as a as a um, evaluation of how well our uh, learning is going. But always we have to keep a, a left out a completely separate uh, testing set which will be used at the end when we have our best model in the way we, we, we think to, to really test uh, that it actually works on something that it has never seen, either as training or, or validation. Um, then a few terms. An epoch uh, is uh, as we're feeding uh, data into this uh, model and it's going around and around, uh, this this uh, learning uh, like process, an epoch is when our net has seen all the training data one time. So if you're feeding it a little little piece of it, once it sees everything one time, this is an epoch. Um, for example, often this might be used. Say uh, you might you might be training something and say I want to stop at thirty epochs uh, or you know, 10 epochs or whatever. Um, so, or if it has reached a point that I like. A batch is, um, is a little piece, a little, a little part of the training data that is fed into the network and is what will do the one loop until the wait update. Uh, so usually for memory, it, uh, you know, to, to not, you, you usually don't put the whole data set in one go and then update everything. Uh, you, can, uh, you can make some smaller batches, feed them and then update faster. And, and this works much better um, when you're training uh, neural networks. And the loss function I already explained a few times is, is the um, function that tell us in which way, it doesn't necessarily need to be mean square error, uh, it can be other things, but it, it's basically a function that will say what we predicted and what's the reality, how far are they from each other. Okay. Um, I will not go over every uh, parameter that it's like a higher level uh, parameter um, of, of, of the network. But one that is important and we'll see later is the learning rate. So the learning rate is something you can set and it has to do with the optimizer and then a weight update mechanism. And this is a, a, a hyperparameter or a parameter of higher level which tells, the, tells your network how fast, how, how far should it jump when it's making an update. Now, if this is set at a very high value, um, then as you see here, uh, the optimal, let's say, jump uh, going down, your, your, your network might be going all over the place and because it, it's updating, it's over, over, uh, overshooting the, the, the goal. Uh, and you might get something like that. If you get a, if you set too small, it will be taking really, really, really small steps, and it might uh, take a long time, or or it might get stuck somewhere, uh, or, or something like that. Um, and the final, um, final uh, thing about uh, terms is a tensor. You already saw it. A tensor is the equivalent of an array or a multidimensional array. So um, everything here, input data, etc., are, we call them in this field tensors, but essentially if you, if you hear the term like 2D tensor, it's a two-dimensional array, 3D tensor, etc. Um, so don't be afraid if you see the word tensor and you don't know what it is, it's a pretty simple thing. Okay. Um, so we saw the one neuron. Now, uh, neural networks generally, uh, 
we're still not at the point uh, where we're talking about deep uh, network. Uh, generally, they are co collections of neurons organized in a specific way. So um, a typical artificial neuro neural network would have, uh, would have several, uh, or we have some layers, maybe only one or maybe a couple of a few layers of neurons. And um, each one of these neurons is essentially what we saw before. It takes inputs has the weights and then it's a function uh, that uh, combines all this together and then um, usually uh, this goes through a, di a through a second function that's called the activation function of the neuron which will do which which will change the output um, in in some way that we might want for example in this example here I have one of the most common um, activation functions, the ReLU activation function, which basically what it does simply is if something is negative, if the value is negative, it becomes zero. So it caps it at zero. If it's positive, it stays as is. Uh, what this can introduce, uh, for example, in your network is non-linearity. Uh, we won't go too deep into this, but just know that if you see something activation function, this is this is what 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 it is. Um, now a fully connected uh, artificial neural network such as this one that I have up here uh, takes inputs into neurons, uh, and then the outputs of these neurons, each neuron, the outputs go into every single one of the neurons in the next layer, and so you can go over several layers and get to the output layer. So um, I guess uh, this is your second example um, that uh, has to do with predicting from images, uh, predicting uh, 110 digits. Uh, so Peter, I think you can take over from here. And uh, Peter? Yes. So, so this okay, is- Okay, you can take over from here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, share screen. And again, this. Uh, no. Sharing. Sure. Okay. I hope you can see me. So this is very famous data set. It's seventy thousand handwritten digits. Uh, you can basically say see the examples uh, on the screen. Uh, and what we will try to do. So so the digits are pretty small. It's uh, just twenty eight times twenty eight pixels. So totally something over 700 dots. And because it's digits, it's 10 classes. Um, I should probably present. Uh, this will be the neural network that we will try to fit over it. So you can see that the input is basically one figure, but instead uh, like using the square, we will basically order uh, the dots one next to one, so because I've, I've told it it's 28, 28 times 28, so it's 728, total number of, of inputs. Then we will put the neurons. Uh, I believe we are putting 500 of them as the hidden layer. So each of the, each of the neuron in the uh, hidden layer is connected to all the inputs. And we have the output layer. What could be the output layer? The output layer are uh, uh, 10 digits. So we have the size of the output layer is 10. Uh, and just to explain what the neural network should do, it should set the weight in a way that in the output layer that, uh, that is uh, corresponding to the digit we are processing, the value should be very high. And in everything else, uh, the, the uh, value should be minimal. Then we will use some transformation that will basically make it uh, in a way that all those values will be between zero and one and will be summing to one, that's the softmax. And we compare it to the target output, so the true output that is coded in a way that if it's, uh, that the one is, uh, what is the digit? So if the digit is, I don't know, six, then, the, then uh, on this place is one and everything else are zeros. 
Okay. Uh, did I forget something? I don't think so. So maybe I'll repeat. So we have uh, many inputs, 700 ish input. We have the hidden layer of uh, roughly 500 uh, hidden neurons. And then we have the output, uh, output layer. So again, 10 neurons. And we are training the data set, uh, training the neural network in a way that we would like to see the high values um, on the neuron that are corresponding to the given digit. Okay. And we will, of course, do it ex as an exercise in the collab. I just realized that 75% of you have never used collab before. Uh, you might run into some problems. Okay, what was that? Uh, and we have uh, like many people that, that uh, can help you if you run into the problem. So don't be shy. Okay, I'm opening. So it's the second, second exercise. And this one should be like, you know, not such a deep magic as was the first one. So what I'm doing, I am again uh, installing FASTA 2s because I have new collab, I need to do it again. Uh, the second line, this one is downloading the data that is on some public platform and I'm loading all the libraries that I will be using. Now, uh, before, because I've just run it, it throw me the warning, the same warning as the last time. And it usually takes a few seconds uh, before it finds the machine that, that is willing to, to run it. Okay. So you can see that it's running. I will do meanwhile one additional check that you, if, if you see that, uh, that your training is running much, fa much slower than my training, then check the runtime and change runtime type and the hardware accelerator should be GPU. If you have none here, that means that, that you don't have graphical processing unit and therefore like it, it needs more time. Uh, which is by the way, uh, absolutely awesome that the collab is uh, coming with the free GPU that's uh, uh, for those of you who are in the field for more than two, three years, it's kind of unbelievable. Okay, so uh, let's load the data set. So the data are uh, in some gzip pickle, uh, pickle file. So we will unzip and unpickle them uh, and we will just look. So, so we have like uh, four arrays, uh, X train, Y train, X valid and Y valid and just plot like one, one data, uh, one, one image. So it's clearly zero and yes, the label, the, the Y one is, is zero. So that's what is expect, expected. This is just uh, basically putting the data in, into the shape we need them. So we need it to be tensor and not NumPy, NumPy array. So that's just some technical thing. And you can see that in the training data set, we have 50,000 uh, images uh, or uh, observations. If each of them is, as I've said, 28 to 28, so 784 values. And uh, the output is from zero to nine. Okay. Uh, this data loader thing is basically you are telling uh, fast AI uh, that those are your data. So if you want to get the data loader, uh, you can either load it from some folder or get it from the data frame. Or in this case, we basically uh, from data set means we are giving you the data set. So this is the train data set. This is the valid data set. I'm not sure whether uh, Panos mentioned uh, the valid data set before, but basically train data set is, uh, is used for training and the valid data set is uh, used for calculating the, uh, the statistics, the metrics, the loss, how, how well are we doing? 
and sometimes you, you also store the test data set because if you you know do many iterations with the train and uh, valid data set you can overtrain even for the validation data set so the train data set is something you ideally don't see till the very end and then you just measure how well are you doing on the test data set uh, and as Panos mentioned, like in the real data, you can't do what we have done in the first example, like load all the data into the memory because they are too huge. So you are loading only uh, a piece of the data every time. And, and batch size means how many uh, samples are you loading for every like optimization step. So, uh, I don't know what the BS, BS is something we must have. Oh, BS is 64. So we are loading 64 uh, images in each step. Let me run it. Okay, so it's, it's running as, as the Python iterator. If you, if you look at that, like we, we just take the first iteration and it's 64 because the batch is 64. And, and each sample is uh, 784 is the X and one is the Y. So Y is N64. Um, okay, let's take some random nine images and, and plot them. That's all what this is doing. So this is, you know, you can see how well are they recognizable like this nine uh, top in the middle is probably hard to predict the rest is, is pretty easy. Okay, and we need to define the neural network. So uh, we uh, do it here as a class and like skip the initialization or, or maybe not. Uh, the initialization is telling, okay, I have some image of some size. You don't have, we don't have even have to tell now. Uh, so this is how many, uh, numbers we have in the input layers. Uh, the FC means, uh, it stands for fully connected. So that means that each neuron in the next layer is connected to all neurons in the previous layer. So, uh, so as, or, or the NN liner in the, in the PyTorch language. So we are, tell, we are telling it, okay, uh, we will have 512 in this like middle layer. And then we are going from this 512 into the 10 layers and 10 layers are the output. And, and the forward is basically like telling it how should we proceed if, if, we, have, if, if, if we have X as the input, then, uh, oh, we will do the, uh, we will do the uh, first uh, fully connected layer, then, then we will do, do ReLU, that's the non-linearity activation that Panos talked like two slides before. Uh, then we do the second fully connected layer. And finally, we do some uh, softmax function. That's uh, what I've mentioned. That's what it squeezed between zero and one and it sums to one. Okay. So that's uh, we have how we have defined our network class, and then we like creating the object. We are telling it, okay, the size of our figures is twenty eight times twenty eight, so it's seven hundred something. And you can see like what we have as the parameters. So you know here it will give you the info about the neural network. And here, if you want to see all the parameters that your uh, algorithm is trying to optimize, you can count them. And so you can see that it's, Jesus, it's tens of thousands. It's basically lots of them. Um, the next uh, step is the actual training, I hope. So we are telling it the learning rate, just to remind you is, uh, what is the size of the step, what we are doing. And the loss function is, uh, is cross entropy loss. Basically, we need to set the loss function. I will go into that. And once we have the data, so we can create the, the learner that will actually do the learning. Uh, so, so to create the learner, we, we, we need the data. We need the architecture, that's our neural network. 
and we need our loss function. If we want, we can also like uh, put some statistics we want to plot, that's called metrics, because uh, otherwise we will get the cross entropy loss, but that's not so easy to interpret, while the accuracy is, is not very easy to interpret. Okay, so uh, what I'm putting here, uh, there are two numbers without parameters, so I will explain that. Uh, the first one is how many epoch do I, do I want to see? So how many times do I go through all the data? And the second one is learning rate. And that's by the way, the mistake because I set the learning rate here and further to, to copy it here. So, you know, let's put it here. Okay. And once I'll run that, it will start, start learning. You can see that this is the number of the mini batches. Okay, so we have 781 mini batches. And uh, so the upper progress bar is, uh, is total uh, learning process. And then we have the small progress bar and that's basically each epoch that, uh, that we are running. Uh, totally we have three epochs. So uh, you can see that one epoch we run roughly in 10 seconds. It could be slightly more on your machine. Don't, don't be scared if like it's not exactly 10 seconds. And we've got uh, accuracy that is basically 98%. This accuracy is calculated on the validation set. The accuracy on the, on the training set that is not much meaningful because if you train for a long time, you will you will overtrain, which by the way, you can see if, if you compare the training loss and the validation loss, you can see that the, in the first epoch, they are very similar. In the second epoch, they are very similar. And like in the last epoch, we are slightly overtraining. That means that we are kind of like memorizing our, our training images. Uh, and we are uh, learning, the, learning the things that, that will not uh, truly, uh, that are not really true, uh, useful for the new images. Okay, and that's basically everything from this example. So we have 98% accuracy. Uh, this is just something I would like to know that in fast AI, the learning rate uh, is not stable. So what we are really putting there is not uh, the constant learning rate, but the maximum learning rate. And, uh, and if you look at this picture, this is like how it changes with each mini batch. So it's uh, starting uh, um, small to get to some like reasonable values, then go up and when we are like close to the optimal value of the parameters, we start to like tune down again to find uh, really the good parameters. Okay, that's all from my side, unless there are some question panels. Is there anything I should address right now or is the helpers that are um let me let me just check one second mm -hmm. um okay so there is uh one question that says do we need 500 neurons to solve an output of nine possibilities well 10 possibilities i like using that. more neurons will solve the classification faster so uh, no, how big uh, is the network that you need um no. i guess and and if you have a bigger network, would it go faster? That's the, that's the kind of question. Okay, uh, Very let me good question, first actually. the first question. No, we absolutely don't need 500 neurons. And I'm glad that somebody is asking because I, I was showing this demo like many times and, and usually nobody asked and I was showing that to my 11 year daughter and she was like, huh, why 500? Like she was not asking whether it's like too much or, or not enough. So what we did is, you know, it's, it's pretty small code. So what if I, instead of 500 neurons, I will do just a hundred. Okay. We will get the model. So now we will have, of course, less parameters. Uh, okay, this stay the same. Now I need, of course, like rerun my learner. And now it will actually run faster because if I have less neurons than, and less parameters, then like each step needs less optimization. So usually you decrease the number of the neurons because you want it to running faster. 
At least I hope it will run faster. It will really. Yes, it used to be 10 seconds and now it's five seconds. Good. Okay, and you can see that the accuracy is like really close. So maybe 100, it's still too many. So I don't know. Let's go with 20. I don't really. So, so if you look here, it's, it's not so many parameters anymore. So why did I use 500? Because the, the example I've copied that for, from uh, was using 500. Okay, so now we have 20. Okay, so 20 is not enough. Like 20 is already 96%, so I have some, uh, some loss of accuracy. But like maybe for many practical applications, it would be okay. And like this kind of syncing is very good because uh, I don't know, if you are trying to get your neural network into the cell phone, then you might be willing to sacrifice 2% on, on accuracy if, if you got your neural network that is just a fraction of the original one. Really, thank you for the question. And I think um, I ca yeah, uh, there's another one, another good question, I think. Um, so someone asks, uh, is the number of layers and neurons, could that be, um, could that be seen as a hyperparameter uh, that could be uh, then, you know, optimized? So yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, yeah. And this is actually what, what is really happening. Like if you look uh, for the like real world ap applications, uh, you know, uh, the people are trying to optimize it. Uh, and there are the libraries that will help you to do that. The thing is that if you kind of like don't care about uh, the time and the size of your network, it's uh, pretty okay to go to as like as huge network as you can afford. Either like uh, time, money, because like big networks, uh, usually uh, cost you some money. So, so, but yes, because like in the old days, the, the network could have been like uh, too big. Well, like the, the smaller network could have the better behavior, but like today uh, it's usually not, not the case. So it's more like what, uh, what would you prefer on the like, time and, and size of the network trade-off. I don't know if I, if it was, okay. was not a bit misleading. Yeah, I think that, I mean, at least to me it makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, I think we should continue because we've uh, already uh, we hit hour. the first oh. hour. Okay. Uh, we have two hours left, but we have many examples left. So, so uh, there's some more questions, there's some more questions. Um, that I think our our helpers uh, will uh, will take, um, and and if we have time at the at the end, we can go back and not, uh, answer some questions, or maybe you know during the next examples. Okay, so okay, so we just finished this uh, this example. So now, um, what we showed before was uh, the idea of fu fully fully connected networks. So the issue with fully connected networks, um, as uh, Petr hit, hinted also uh, during the demonstration, is that uh, since everything is connected with everything, you, you, your, your number of uh, weights and parameters kind of balloons uh, pretty fast. Um, so there is this uh, more uh, recent, I mean, it's not that recent, but anyway, thing that is used more now, uh, which is called the convol convolutional neural network, uh, which we will show you. And uh, the idea of the convolutional neural network is that uh, you take an input and you pass it through a, a small filter, 
So this is your input here, for example. It's a digit uh, with intensities. And you pass it through a filter. So what this filter does, imagine that this filter goes through the, the whole, this whole matrix and it calculates, it multiplies these little, um, these, these weights with a part of, the, of this matrix and produce a value. Now, how, how, depending on how this filter is, this little filter is set up, it could be used to do different things. So for example, this filter here uh, has uh, high values on the top three, uh, zeros in the middle and minus ones in at the bottom. So this uh, thing will um, will identify essentially places where you have. Uh, if you think you're multiplying this, it will it will identify places where you have a high value in one line, and then uh, you know it will penalize if you have like a. a, a, a high value in the bottom line. So I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but if you multiply this by this, you identify horizontal lines essentially. Now, if you take the same filter, you may take a different filter that is similar in idea, but vertical, uh, you can use that to identify vertical lines. Now imagine if you have many of these filters, each one of these filters is learning something different now uh, so um, in the past uh, 10 years essentially uh, these convolutional neural networks uh, gave a big breakthrough in image recognition so there's this uh, big data set of images called ImageNet that you see here and this this um, has uh, thousands or I don't know millions of images um, that have been manually uh, separated or uh, you know uh, they, they have labels of hundreds of different categories for example fish you know you would get a bunch of pictures like that and um, there's a competition every year who can predict best uh, you know these categories and uh, you see that the, from 2011 to 2012, uh, there this was when the first convolutional neural networks were used here, and uh, the error dropped from 25% to uh, 16%. And then you see here the the depth of of these networks that start becoming uh, available uh, and becoming bigger, deeper and deeper. And then you reach a point where with in 2015 with the 152 layers, uh, this is kind of the, the limit, uh, approximately the limit of, of, of humans also. Um, so uh, this was a very useful and it is still a very useful and, and, and highly used uh, type of, uh, of, neural, of neural network. Um, so, um, the idea here, just to get the concept, is that when you start the first layers, as I showed you with the weights, they start learning very basic things like lines, uh, gradients, this type of thing. Now, as you start going, you're connecting the output of these layers as input to the next ones. So as you connect them to the next ones, the next layers le learn combinations of the previous ones, of the weights of the previous ones. And then, so the second, so as the first layer is learning like basic things like lines, the second layer might start learning something like circles, uh, wavy lines, or line um, patterns, like simple patterns. Once you start reaching the third uh, layer, you see like more specific things, and by the fourth layer, you have things like you know the face of a dog, for example, uh, has already formed, or uh, you know eyes. Uh, ears, faces, wheels, things like that. So eventually you can imagine that I saw this network had a hundred or whatever layers, you can get into very, very uh, uh, elaborate and high, high level um, 
uh, patterns. So this is the idea here. And uh, so again, the idea is that you start, you're trying to identify if this is a cut. You start, your first layer will learn basic things like diagonal lines, uh, uh, things like that. Then deeper layers, not necessarily one, but deeper layers will identify things like eyes, noses, ears, etc. And then it, it, this will classify the image as a cat or, or a dog or whatever. Or in our case, cancer or... Okay, so your third example will be doing exactly this. Uh, you will take some uh, images, a smaller data set, um, and you will you will uh, try to all, or you will classify them uh, into different uh, categories. So I will uh, stop my. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I will stop sharing. Uh, Peter, you take it from here, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, if I can ask if you could go to the uh, bit.ly ECCB, as I will. And now we are the example number three. And what we have here is basically the subset of the ImageNet. Just to remind you, ImageNet was th this big uh, image data set uh, with the famous competition on it. Uh, but the difference is, uh, okay, run anyway. The difference is we don't have uh, a thousand class, we have only 10 class, and then those 10 class are, you know, not very similar. Uh, so it's not like 10 different breeds of, of dogs or, or something. If you look like what's the class number, it's in the fifth cell, it's basically 10. If you don't know what stench, it's some way of fish, something like carp, English Springer, Cusset player, chainsaw, church, French horn, garbage truck, gas pump, golf ball, and parachute. So one of those ten. Uh, so it's it's a little funny example, but what's what's nice about it, if you would try here to train on the image net, it would need not hours but probably days while uh, training on this will be just a couple of the minutes. Uh, if you look, uh, so, so this is, if the, if the data set is part of the FastAI, it's extremely easy to get it because FastAI has the helper. So if you run this, it will download the data set and, and return the path when it's downloaded. So you can see that, you know, even if it's small, it's not so small. So it's like being downloaded for a couple of the second. Okay. And, and it's being organized into like two subfolders. One is the subfolder with the training set, the other is subfolder with the validation set. And then each of those has uh, other level of hierarchy, other subfolders that is uh, image net label. So it's not anything meaningful, it's N and then some numbers. So it's image net ID. And in those uh, are, are the actual figures. So I don't know how many do we have for, Oh, so totally, if I get it correctly, we have roughly 10,000 images in the training set. So uh, let's create uh, our fast AI uh, data set, or it's called data loaders, because data set is something that you have in the memory. Data loaders is something that is able to fetch the data from somewhere. So you work only with the image batch. So here we are fetching the data from the folder. Mm, we are giving the path. We are telling it that the validation folder is called VAL. Uh, we do some um, random scaling and so on. So because the images could be of the different size, so we need to like 
get them to the same size. The last one, I would rather not comment. It's, it's more like the technical things for how we normalize the data. Okay, so let's do it. It might take a few seconds, but I hope it's not extra long. Okay, and let's print the random random batch. Uh, so we can see that it's nine images. Unfortunately, the labels are not much readable and you need to like decode them here. So on the first image is this fish and so on. Okay, so it's roughly what we have. Uh, what we would do is the training. So the architecture of the network, we will now not specify manually, but we will take uh, the something that is uh, a part of the fast AI. So ResNet is one of the winner of the, uh, of the ImageNet and it's coming with the pre-train equals false. Why am I doing that? Because otherwise it would like load the values with the like idle image net uh, classification and then it would be no fun. Uh, I create a learner object like in like previous things with metrics accuracy. And again, I fit uh, five epoch with this learning rate. Let's do it because it's like rather slow. Um, and maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe I should comment that if uh, th this is more like the textbook example, because like if that would be your data, you would never do the pre-train equals false because you know, if, if something was useful, usefully trained for several days on the uh, thousands of or tens of thousands, uh, maybe millions of images, then you don't want to like, waste that useful information. It, it's more like that even if you have never seen ImageNet before and somebody would give you do the task, you can basically solve it in five minutes with today's computer, which is, you know, kind of fascinating. Okay, uh, Panos, meanwhile, uh, it's training. Are there any questions? Uh, give me one sec, real quick, sir. Um, okay, there's one question uh, mm -hmm. that says, how do you choose the batch, the batch size? Is it only <laughs> related to hardware capacity? Uh, yes, it's, it's mostly related to the size of your GPU. In some rare cases, it could be the size of your memory. Uh, and uh, like what I'm usually doing is coming with as uh, large batch size as I can uh, before uh, it's uh, getting slower. So, you know, you start with some number, I don't know, 64. Uh, what batch size do I have here, by the way? Um, yeah, where it is. I can find it. Do you see what big size I'm using? So probably I'm using just the default value. Uh, and uh, but there are some rare cases. Like if you use some really huge big size, uh, then the quality of your model could go down. So. Honestly, the, the selection of the batch size is, is, is a bit an alchemy. And, and sometimes I'm trying like two or three values. Mm -hmm. I, uh, one thing maybe since we have some time, um, what we, uh, we noticed uh, in one of the, of the examples, uh, one, one of the things we're doing in the lab was not not so much the the size of the batch size of the the batch size that was so important, but the composition because we work often with this uh, very highly imbalanced data set. So one class might have way more um, uh, examples than the other one, and um, sometimes we would get this 
several batches that were only one class inside. So our model will basically just learn, very quickly learn, just call everything this class and, and, and nothing else matters. And uh, we had actually, we improved uh, pretty, pretty substantially uh, our training by uh, basically forcing the forcing the 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 batches to contain some of the less represented class as well. I don't know if um, that's kind of anecdotal. You know, it's like it's not like we haven't published. This. No, no, that's definitely not anecdotal. But it's just something it's that maybe you know, if you, uh, like if yeah. you're working with the um, with the text with the natural language processing. Uh, I have actually seen it, not, not by myself, but by one of my colleagues in, in my previous job. And, um, you know, if you are imagine sentence, so sentence could be uh, long or could be short. And if you don't uh, match the short and long sequences in a way that, that they are, uh, the similar lengths is in the batch, uh, in the old batch, uh, you need to so-called Pad uh, the shorter sequences, so you will basically add their zeros mm -hmm. to make them, and and that really can like hurt. Uh, first of all, the effectivity of uh, of your algorithm, and then I believe even the metrics. I, I so, remember that they have kind of the same story that that they uh, do some very small thing like to pair uh, the training sentences of the similar uh, length uh, and, and it suddenly it like worked much better. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's a bit digressing. Okay, so hopefully we have our- One more, one more epoch. One more epoch. Maybe I should have, <laughs> you know, a run smaller model, but that's what we have. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Um, okay, so there, there's one question I think they're answering, our guys are answering, but the basic idea is uh, if you could um, somehow compress the image, uh, would that decrease the computational workload and not lose too much uh, final, you know, not lo lose too much power in the final prediction. That's actually an excellent question. And what the fast AI is, is, is doing, like, and we will not go here in the details. If you think about it, you can start with the small images. You can start with all the images that are like scaled down and train the network a bit. And once you, you know, you have the network of some quality, you will increase the image size. You basically like progressively uh, sending the network bigger and bigger images. And, and oh, to okay. explain how that works is really like not part of the tutorial. And to be totally honest, I, I would need to read, read it again to, to explain. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So it, we have run it in roughly six minutes and we've got to 80% accuracy. So with uh, probably to 80% we select the, the right class. And you know, what would be the model if you couldn't test it? So the collab uh, will allow you to, to load your own model. So um, if I run this uh, cell, I will get choose files button. If I go there, I can select uh, the file on, on, on my local laptop. I don't know. This one is, is the one that was there. Uh, should I Google some new one? No, no, we, we don't have time for that. So let me load the file so you can see it's loading, it's, it's loaded. So I will get it to the correct format. Okay, and I will run the prediction and I'll get the tench, which is some kind of carp. So it's roughly what I expected. Okay, and that is all about example three and we should continue. Um, actually, I think at this point, uh, we, can take a, we can take a short break.
10 minutes uh yeah 10 like 10 minute break uh, okay so it's uh, 6 uh, p.m 20 the, the european so 6 30 6 30 so will start again will continue okay bye I can also just, um, since we are in break, I can give, a, I don't know, actually, maybe I should wait until everybody's back, but uh, imbalanced data sets are a huge issue for us because um, when it comes to bi biological data sets, you often have these huge imbalances, especially we do genomics and you have things like you're looking for specific type of genes or, or, or transcripts in the genome, your background is going, is going to be maybe a million times bigger than your, um, you know, what you're looking for. So we, we are actually actively working with these heavily, heavily imbalanced data sets and trying to figure out ways to, uh, to make things work in that way, because it would be also, I mean, impossible or counterproductive to uh, try and learn everything that is in the background uh, before you can uh, uh, identify the things you are looking for. Um, it's very common to see papers with very balanced data sets, like artificially uh, balanced data sets. But then often what we've seen is that when um, we, sometimes we, we might take a method like this and try to apply it in a real world setting, like for example, uh, scanning a genomic region to find uh, positions of interest. And because this method, many methods have been trained on completely balanced data sets, then what you see is a very high false positive rate because they're used or they've learned to, that, that posit, like your 
label that you care about and the background could approximately be about 50 50 so they they do tend to predict that about that that um, that rate ratio or they have not seen enough background to actually capture all the variation that could exist in the background which is also another issue um, so it's it's kind of a complicated uh, situation when it comes especially to to genomics um, and and yes there are there are some techniques such as uh, weights like weight loss um, that you can use uh, we we try to do what we tried what we did with some uh, success previously was to use use a kind of uh, uh, do, do several uh, iterations of training with with changing the background uh, making it progressively harder and harder um, like tougher and tougher um, by picking negatives that that uh, uh, tripped up our, our initial models um, but that that worked uh, now we're exploring many different many different things uh, but this actually I think we are we're actively working on in our lab. Um, so it's not it's not that simple. And and you see this a lot, like in theory, like you 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 could the um in practice maybe um there are some problems that you don't expect when you're starting to do a to 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 create a model, but then you have to deal with these real world problems that are uh, often harder than uh, picking the right layer size or or whatever. Okay, I'm going to take a break as well. We have five minutes. Three minutes. Okay, so we can continue. Um, yep. Actually, Peter, you, you're, you, that's your part, right? <laughs> that's my part. Could you keep the slide on? Or I'll, I, okay. can, or I, I can do the next couple of slides and then we can, we can switch. Yeah, or or you whatever. Can. No, no, you can. Yeah. Okay, oh. yeah, that's fine. Okay, so... Um, okay, so that, that was the previous thing you did. Uh, you classify the bunch of pictures 
uh, using a pre-trained or or using the architecture of a pre-trained of 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 a, of, an, of a convolutional neural network. Now, um, as Peter showed you, you took this architecture, but you you took it empty essentially, like the weights were not pre-trained. But uh, when you have a when you have an architecture such as this one, uh, and you know it's really deep and it's really hard to train, takes a lot of effort uh, and money. Um, you might want to avoid retraining everything every time you want to use it for a different uh, task. For example, as I showed you earlier, uh, the first layers of of the convolutional neural network. Uh, could learn things like lines, uh, circles, patterns, etc. Which, if your task is close enough to what um, this network was trained for, could be pretty useful. But the last layers that say, you know, this is a, I don't know, a fish, and this is a church, uh, and what you were doing, uh, might not be the categories you want. For example, so what you could do is a process called transfer learning, which means very very like uh, uh, basic in a basic idea that you can remove uh, the the last few layers of of the network and um, lock the the weights in the in the rest of the of the network remove the last layers put some new layers so and, and then retrain only that part um, so this is uh, basically a way to, or, or you could, or you could uh, fine tune, which means that you would uh, slightly change all the weights of the pre-trained network to just uh, go go closer to to your new task. And this can be extremely useful because you have these huge uh, networks that have already been trained, for example, to identify these images, and then you could take these things that they've learned and use them in a task like, uh, for example, medical imaging uh, or something like that. So the, so that's exactly the next example that you will do um, is uh, to, uh, to do the me medical images. Um, and also, yeah, there is a, there's a link here for it, for a useful tutorial, if uh, you're, because this is, yeah, maybe or you I can, can you can go ahead. Yeah, you, you can you can you <laughs> because can because we originally promised to do the medical imaging as, as part of this tutorial, and the trouble is not that fast. I couldn't do that actually. The fast type package has like the sub module that is like focused on the medical imaging only, like to easily read the data of the of the X-ray images and so on. Uh, the trouble is that I didn't find any good data set that would be in the public domain because if it's on the Kaggle, then it's not on the public domain. And that, uh, that would be like in the reasonable size. So it's not like running for two hours. So I, I finally uh, decided to do something else slightly. And, and that is to show you like how you can, if you want to create basically any data set you want, how you can do it. And the answer is, of course, you can find the images on the internet. So how would you get the images from the internet? Uh, by some search machine. And this, this search machine could be Google image search. That's what we used to do. Uh, but those days the Google make it a bit harder for you to do that. So instead of we will use the Bing, the Microsoft uh, uh, image search. Uh, Pet Petr, do you need me to stop sharing and you, uh, you should uh, share oh, your yes, screen? Sorry. Could you stop sharing? I, I forget that. Thanks. Okay, I hope you can see. So, so this is already the collab so uh, please go to, to the GitHub and, and click the example four. So this is the transfer learning again. Ignore the warning. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I, I will continue to use the Bing image search basically to get 
the URLs of the images. So, so if I just do the Bing image search, somehow I always have problems if I'm on the, uh, okay, I can do it here. So if I do Bing, sorry, I don't remember. I don't need IPRs, I need just the search. So if I, for example, write a dog, you know, it will give you the lots of the images of dogs, but you somehow need those images of dogs on your computer. That would be easy if you would know the URLs of each individual image, but, but somehow the search machines are not so happy that you would use them not to search the images yourself, but by some robot that is just downloading the images. So if you want to do that, you and if you want to do that on the large scale, you need to pay for that. And Bing provides the search API, which is basically free if you use it as normal people do. And if, uh, if it's pretty cheap, if you use it on some larger scale. So, but you need to register because they ca can't allow like anybody downloading lots of images. So what, I have done is that I have uh, do it on my account and, and save uh, those results of those search and I can provide you the provide you the, uh, those files. If you would like to do it with your own image class and you would like to do it yourself, the code is basically here. The only thing that you need to change, you need to set the key to your Bing image search API. So you need to register for the Microsoft account, uh, get the Azure and get the Bing image search. It's, it's not so complicated. It's just not something that I am able to do with all of you in 10 minutes. It, it, it will basically take too much time. So I will skip this section because I have, done it by myself and so sorry i forgot to say what i was searching i was searching for kidney liver and spleen histology tissue histology totals so uh, okay so uh, i have saved it to some file that you can look at so this is living somewhere on our github if i will show it you know it's it's basically just the CSV table, you have one uh, column where the URLs of the images that should be uh, kidney, hist kidney normal histology, the other should be liver normal histology, and the last one should be spleen normal histology. So I'm trying to classify three classes. Okay, so uh, I, I was given you just the URL, so we need to download the images to actually live on the collab. Okay. So you can see uh, in each class we have 150 images. So total it's uh, 450. Okay, so some of them we were unable to download. So we have 446. Uh, if you are downloading the images, quite often uh, it happens that the file that is being downloaded is not really the image. Uh, you know, the uh, web page found that, that you are not Google and not their user. And basically it's uh, sending you some like, I don't know, CAPTCHA or something. So, so this is to uh, detect those failed downloads because otherwise we would run into the problems very soon. So there is the special function in the fast AI to verify the images. And you can see that yes, <laughs> almost like more than one fifth of our images is, 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 has failed. We are unable to really create the image. So uh, this is basically telling uh, the Python like delete them all so we can work on 350 images, but yeah, 
we don't want anything that is not an image. Uh, so uh, we are going from data to data loaders. You might observe that what I'm showing is slightly different than previously. And that is because FastAI allows you to run on different levels. If you are doing something that, that everybody is doing, it's, it's very easy, it's fully automatic, and it's not so much customable. If you would like to do something that is, you know, not so common, but, uh, but still not so, uh, not so complicated, you have the data block, that's also you have the middle level API. And if you want, you know, if you're the researcher and you would like to implement totally new algorithm, you also have like the lower level API that basically can do almost anything. Okay, so this is, we are creating a data set slightly different way than what you have seen before. Oh, taking longer than I would guess. Okay, let's uh, show four random images. Oh, Jesus. Okay, some of those are pretty crazy. Um, and you can see the image and the label is above the image. So this should be kidney, this should be spleen, kidney, kidney, with no liver by chance. Um, if you, uh, like imagine that we are working with pretty small data set. We would like uh, fast AI to figure out like everything based on roughly 350 images. So we would somehow need to decrease our sample size. And like one way uh, how to do that is not use every image just once, but try to do some small transformation, like make it brighter, make it, uh, I don't know, more noisy, uh, add some noise, uh, at, at, at the contrast or decrease the contrast on the other way. And, and actually this appears to, to like improve the quality of your network considerably because the network on the way is learning like uh, what, what matters and what doesn't matter. So, so this is basically taking one image and doing uh, eight random transformation. Okay, uh, by random I'm picking very strange images. So let's continue. Um, this is really doing the training. So here we are using the ResNet 18 as the architecture, but we are keeping the weights. We are not, uh, we are not starting from zero. We are starting from the weights that have been learned on the ImageNet images. And we just try to fine tune. So first uh, train last few layers and then train everything with much lower learning rate. Okay, so uh, we slash the array that originally, like before the fine tuning was 65 and after the fine tuning is uh, 24. So we are right in like three cases out of four. Uh, we can look at the confusion matrix. So this is basically telling you, okay, if it's, uh, so the validation set is rather small, so I would not trying to over interpret it, but at least so, so this is what's, what is actual. So we have like most of the kidneys are classified as kidneys. That's good. The same with the liver and the spleen, but we definitely have some like misclassifications on not so much low rate, but you know, the thing is because those are just uh, images, uh, histology images downloaded through the Bing search, you can see uh, that some of them doesn't really look like the histology or not doesn't look, are not histolo histology images at all. Uh, and like, um, yeah, so, so that's uh, why there is like a, a huge um, a loss between the training and validation set. Um, you can also predict the new sample like very similarly like we have did. So I don't know, I think I have here some spleen image. So if I load the spleen image, okay. 
I've got it. And if I do the classification, I can see, yes, it's clean with like 80%, that's good. Um, okay, so that's all the code. If you would like- Can I, can I um, just read the question that I think it's definitely, interesting? Definitely, definitely. Um, it says, if, if you do this uh, data, data augmentation, where you mm -hmm. pick different variations, could you run into a problem of overfitting because of it? That's a good question. Like you mean? Uh, I think I the, the I think I think the the question is like if you are um, using basically a smaller data set, but you know using every mm -hmm. image, I don't know, ten times. Uh, would you would your model learn these specific images more uh, and and fit more on them? Yeah, you mean like some pattern, like if you look uh -huh. at this clean and it, it would basically learn the circle even if it's right it has nothing to do with the screen i don't know like like my practical experience is quite the opposite but i don't mm -hmm. have a really good theoretical answer i i think what what i would say is that because you're because overfitting i mean there, there are many reasons but one of the reasons could be that your your images have some kind of specific um external thing or 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 a specific like maybe all your spleen images have a you know a, a certain kind of little thing on them or whatever if you, if you do all these variations you have a better chance of um let's say ironing out the the kind of artifacts that are in there if you because there's some zooming maybe some tilting and things like that that would be magnifying. my kind of yeah. magnifying. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. I, don't I don't know. know. That, that's kind of practical knowledge. Not not necessarily. I have that. I have. A... By the way, if you are playful, or if you are looking for some demo, um, like if you get get this uh, Microsoft API working, it, it's really fun. You can basically do the classifier of anything. Like I have seen the classifier of images, Steve Jobs versus John Rambo, and, <laughs> or I don't know, architectural style, styles and so on. And we will not show it here, but it's part of the fast day course. So I encourage you to look there. It's relatively easy to let this model running for free on some server. So you can then get your cell phone and like go through the city and take a, on your camera of your cell phone a random object or random people and classify them into into some functional classes and, and look how, how your model is, is working or not. Okay, that was the digression. Okay, uh, yeah, there is some, uh, there is a, there's a comment about bias, which I think it's a little bit longer. And if we have time at the end, we can discuss a little bit. Okay. Um, and we are also, we basically have one hour left and we have two big examples. So I think we should continue with the, with the presentation maybe. Fine. So I'll continue if there will be a, the time at yeah. the end, we will answer the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, we will go to like the, the last part. Uh, and those are the sequential data. Um, so I will kind of go through it together, no matter whether it's NLP, the NLP is, stands for uh, natural language processing, basically some text, or whether it's genomic sequences like the DNA or RNA, because, and that's like my personal opinion, uh, that there are many connections. Uh, if you process it, you are going through the similar steps. So you are first like cutting your sequence into the pieces, into the tokens. Then you somehow make a vocab vocabulary and uh, like put the number on each of the uh, token you have there. Uh, and then you could use some embedding and language model and even the transfer learning. The, the last three thing is uh, pretty common in the NLP and rather uh, rare or not so much used in the genomic sequences. But the question is if the reason is not that the NLP is like more trendy or, or more ahead. 
Okay, so let, let's um, let's explain what I mean by tokenization on some actual example. So imagine then you have some piece of the DNA. Uh, then you will like cut it into the pieces. Uh, like today we will mostly be using the pieces of, of one letter, but you can use like longer pieces, like the three letters. Uh, then you have some like finite number of the possibilities that you can get like that. So you want the same triplets to get the same, uh, to get the same number. So you basically start with something that was the sequence and add something that are the numbers and once you have the numbers uh, you can feed it into the neural network. Uh, the usual way how to feed it is to do one more transformation and that's like uh, one hop encoding or something like that. Uh, when, you, when you basically put the one on the position of the number and zero everywhere else. Everywhere else. And because if you have like big dictionary, imagine like the English language or imagine that we will use here uh, k-mers of six or something, then the dimension would be huge. So there's like the small trick uh, and the small trick is, okay, the, the dimension is too huge for my neural network to, to really process those, those data. So I will learn it, the transformation to the smaller dimension. The, the trick, you might heard the, the term word to vec. Just as a funny coincidence, it has been found in, in Brno, so, so where we are sitting. Uh, of course, very soon transported to the Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, so no matter whether you start with the sentence or, or the DNA, you end up either with those one hot encoded sequence or, or with some kind of the learned embedding. And with that, you would like to feed the, the network. Uh, so far, uh, we have been using only the classical network, sequential, uh, where you start with the input, then you could have some hidden layers, and at the end, you have the output layer that you compare to your predicate, like the you get the prediction and you compare it to the real value. Uh, for sequences, uh, we more often use the recurrent neural network, uh, which in a way uh, the, we have like the same, same cell and the output is basically beginning the input of the like next round. You know, so, so it can be like, um, it can be like rolled out like this. Uh, so those are the simple recurrent neural network. Uh, there in actual research, uh, uh, the people are, are using something slightly more complicated, uh, but very complicated for explanation. So I'll skip it. I would just like mention those terms, uh, LSTM and GRU. And the reason why we need that is that this, uh, this recurrent neural network is having some kind of memory because like each uh, output is becoming input, but it, uh, unfortunately, this memory is like very short. It's, it's like therefore getting like too soon. So, so both of those are basic, basically trig how to like keep the gradient, keep the memory for longer time. And as the example, we will uh, use uh, the generation of sequences, both of some random text of some, or some random DNA. And this will be our next example. So let me go there. Good. Second generation. Okay, so the first Cell is running as usual. I, I would rather check the running type because here it would really like bite me, but it seems that it's okay. Okay, and uh, there are several uh, like data sets that, that I found on the internet. Mm, by default, I'm using the, some uh, Friedrich Nietzsche text, 
but if you don't like it, uh, those, uh, the other usual choices are uh, Shakespeare sonnets or Obama speeches. The style of the generated text would be, of course, slightly different. So let me download the, the file from the Amazon S3 bucket. So it seems that it's working. Let me, okay. So, so this is the beginning, I guess, of some book or something. And I will like specify it as the text data loader. So, so you can see that until now we have been using like image data loaders. Now we have text data loader and that's kind of all what I need to do. Also, uh, I'm actually using the pre-trained, uh, let me put it there explicitly because I'm using, no, sorry, that's, that's wrong, not in this step. Uh, so let me show you like what my, what my data looks like. Uh, okay, I'm really sorry for some reason, I don't have here the last version of the file. Okay, what can we do? Doesn't matter. So uh, what is missing is I, I've put here a few lines with, uh, with how to do the, the tokenization and how to number the tokens and that is not here, but we see what is going related to the network. And, and that is uh, basically the language model. So what the network is trying to predict, it's trying to predict the next, uh, the next word. And it's also like, um, it, it converted the text. So you can see that there are no like, upper letters, instead of that, it, it adds the special word, X, X up means that the next word is starting with the upper letter. Uh, the other special word is X, X boss. That's basically saying, okay, this is the beginning of the text. And X, X unknown means that it's got some, some word that is not in the dictionary. Okay, so we are trying to predict the next word. And we already using the pre-trained model that was pre-trained on the Wikipedia, and we are only fine-tuning it to the to the Nietzsche's text. Okay, so yeah, I, I'm sorry for that. There is a part of the code missing, but let me at least like um, like go through this. So you I can you can still uh, later up, up, update yeah, yeah, it, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll later so if the, people want to uh, look at it later. Okay, so you can like the 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 uh, text is not very long, so so uh, and I'm not using here the validation set, so that's why you see the none in the validation column, and yeah, so I can even provide the beginning of the sentence, like there is something, and let let it like the finish. Okay. And you can get the sentence that might not be perfect, but yeah, looks okay. In the first one, the soul is, is beginning a lot. Uh, but uh, like this was all like very hard task a few years ago, but uh, on the way the, the new models uh, with uh, a huge parameter space appear, GPT-2 and GPT-3. And if you have never uh, do the ver writing with transformers, so writing with, with those models, I encourage you to do that. Uh, they work a, a bit better than this toy example. You, you really start the sequence and it will, it will basically suggest how to continue. But I have here more, more like the introduction into what I want to do and I want to generate random DNA sequence, not the random text. So, uh, okay, how to get something, for example, as a false control uh, with the sequences that looked like the real human genome or uh, uh, real intergenomic human genomes, but really are not, is to take, uh, take the real intergenomic sequences. And here I, I first like randomly pick them on the genome, uh, then like, 
put them on our GitHub, and, and finally I'm taking just 5,000 of the sequences. Each of them is, I believe, 200 base per long. And I cut them in a way that if they are on the chromosome one, they are validation set. And if they are anywhere else, then they are train set. So let me show the data. So you can see like, here's even the position, here's the sequence. I'll put it uh, into the way the fast I need it. So the, the, the one folder, all the sequences in the training set are in one folder, all the rest is in the other folder. Now I need to give it the tokenizer, like the, for the mm, normal English text, the tokenizer is provided by fast AI, but of course genomic is, is not such a popular use, so I need to do it myself. Okay, so, so this is my small tokenizer. Why am I loading it from the file? Because it's like twice faster uh, if, if I don't do it in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so, so basically all what I'm doing is I'm cutting the DNA sequence here into the individual characters. I could do triplets if I would need that. Okay, so let me load it. And that, then let me test it on the small sentence and you can see, okay, those are my tokens. And now like in the original uh, text example, there was the example like this, like take the sentence and cut it into the tokens. Okay, now I put everything together. So I have tokenizer, I have the training set, the validation set. And you can see that, that again, it looks really similar. I have the language model, so I'm trying to predict what will be my next, uh, what will be my next character. So if it's starting A, G, and T, then the correct answer is C in this case. Okay, so this is uh, a language model learner, totally the same as we have been using for the natural language, uh, language processing. And because I'm not sure what should be the learning rate, in, in the fast AI there, there is like a very cool way how, uh, how the fast AI can like suggest learning rate for you. And like, I'm not sure whether I want to go into the technical details, but basically it's, uh, trying to uh, increase learning rate until everything gets crazy. So, oh Jesus. <laughs> okay, that's not the image I wanted to see because this one is complicated. But basically you're trying to go uh, with the steeper things or you, you want to be close to the minimum but not really at the minimum because at the minimum it's, it's, it's not working. It's already not working. So here, I, I, I would say that 10 to the power of minus one looks reasonable. So let me do this. Okay, so- uh, Peter, anyway, anyway, this is the maximum uh, learning rate again, right? Yes. So but it, will be variable, with... it will be automatically variable. Yes, uh, okay. correct. Correct. So yeah, I am mm, speaking about setting the lear learning rate, but actually it's the, it's the maximal learning rate and the learning rate is uh, chosen based on the scheduler. Okay. I did just two epochs, uh, but you can see that even after one epoch, we have like almost 30% to predict what will be, just to remind you, 25% is the random chance. So if you are on the, on the 30, then we are way above the random chance. And I believe we can do even slightly better. Let's try it. Yeah, not really. So here you can see that that never happened during this course. Uh, the accuracy actually goes slightly down and not up. What can we do? 
uh, the, the reason why uh, the, the accuracy is lower than what I'm used to in my experiments is that we are training only two laws, uh, only, only two epochs. But uh, if you then want to do the prediction, you will do it with kind of the same code as for the text generation and you will get something. The only like, uh, I would say, unfortunate thing that unlike the uh, natural text or English text for DNA, it's quite often not so easy to, to see if it's like not working really well. But in the next example, I hope I kind of prove that like, it's not total gibberish, it's not total nonsense. Okay, so we have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Should I? Yeah, um, I, I, um, maybe even before we started with the question, we should emphasize that there is like the big difference to what we are showing now and what we have been showing in like the first half of the course, like the image uh, analysis of the NLP, like the, the text mm -hmm. is like the established and we are kind of presenting here what is known, while for the genomic sequences, those are uh, our experiments, our methods, and like there's much higher mm -hmm. chance that something is not good or not optimal. So one question is, uh, how, how, how do you define uh, the loss function for sequence data sets? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a classification problem and like both things, I'm trying to predict the next token. So the same way how if you would have like N classes, then it, it doesn't much matter whether you are classifying images or whether you are classifying uh, classifying words. So it's again some kind of entropy and we are again uh, reporting the accuracy because it's more human readable than Okay, another, another question is, uh, what, what does it mean perplexity measure of your training? Oh, Jesus. Okay, so, so let's <laughs> get here uh, from my code. And I know it's a function of the entropy and it's, it's there because the, the NLP people, the natural language processing people, used it like uh, way before neural networks. So it's like their favorite uh, okay so maybe if you uh if you don't want to explain right now i can leave this question open and then someone yeah uh no, no else I, can 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 actually answer it uh yeah, by text I, I like more, more accurate. i can look at the wikipedia but yeah it's fine thing. let's not lose time to yeah to, uh, go to deep. This, the thing is if, it, if it's a text then the people uh, want to want to know the perplexity because the accuracy at the text is is not really so much meaningful, but 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 the perplexity kind of make the algorithms comparable. Okay, let's move. Okay, we have another uh, comment about going a little bit deeper about how the embedding uh, uh, example is done, but I think that comment was from before you showed the your code that does the embedding. Uh, are there any math math formulae uh, to give that specific embedding? Uh, so the embedding, maybe I can stop. If, if you are a mathematician and you know the principal component analysis, so so this is kind of the same thing. But and and the, like the main advantage of the embedding is that it's much faster to compute. You would never like uh, run PCA on the like uh, in, in the big uh, language text, uh, English text, but you can do the embedding. That's, that's basically the thing. So you, you are trying to squeeze the number of the dimension and you are trying to keep as much information as possible. Okay. Um, one more question. Can we, uh, it says, can we see genomic sequence like an image? What information can we get from an image view and from a language view? So I guess I th I think that means it's kind of um, I guess how I would phrase it is uh, what's the difference between using recurrent neural networks what you showed now 
uh, versus uh, convolutional neural networks, what you know we were talking about before. No, 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 no. those are or, or two, maybe... two different questions. So okay. first of all, and I, I should, um, uh, so I will first answer your question. So I'm using the here recurrent neural networks, but there are people that are using convolutional neural networks, both on like uh, English text and both on uh, like uh, genomic sequences, like our lab is probably using more convolutional network than recurrent neural network. Um, but I, I will not talk to you here because it would be like too much. Uh, and then there like is the differencing and I believe that's what Google used in their like um, variant calling algorithm. It was like, yeah, the sequences are not working so well, but we have so, such a good algorithm for the images. So you take the DNA and you say, okay, each, uh, each um, uh, letter, each, each base pair will be one square. And if this square is um, A, it will be orange. If it's T, it will be blue. If it's, uh, you, you guess what I mean. So, so you basically, uh, you translate your sequence into the image and then you use a normal image classification algorithm that you already did. And like, that sounds crazy. Like, oh my God, wh why am I doing that? And it's working surprisingly well. Uh, and it's, by the way, not only limited for the sequences. I have seen people uh, uh, doing that with the sound data, that instead of like uh, letting it to understand the wave, they just take the photo of some, I believe, uh, a Fourier transform of, of, the, of, the, of the music, and then use it as the picture and then do the classification of the pictures, which again is like you are losing tons of the information on the way, but it was working pretty good. So mm -hmm. yes, people are doing that. Okay, uh, there's one more question, but I think that, or there's a couple more, but I think one that you will just uh, answer with your next uh, uh, slides or your next example is what kind of examples of biological question uh, someone could answer by applying this type of natural language processing. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, let's, let's wait. So this that, is the uh, next, the next the kind of the next example. And um, there's a question about uh, low complexity regions. Uh, as a, <laughs> so yeah, like repetitive sequences could uh, increase the accuracy in yes. generating real sequences. I think yes. this, you also touch on this later, right? Uh, or yeah. in the next example, it's By the more... way, pretty good question because I yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. realize it when I started this project. <laughs> so somebody... Okay, so let's let's continue and, and I, I think I think after the next example, this might be a little more clear and yeah. hopefully we'll have some time at the end. We have 45 minutes about left. Okay, so let okay. me continue with the slides. So, uh, so I've already kind of touched that the transfer learning, uh, which is something that started on the images, later like get to the uh, to the NLP and for sequences in general as well, and, and the reason is totally the same as for the images because you can take like large corpuses of the text. The most often they take Wikipedia. So you take Wikipedia and trying to predict the, the next word on the whole Wikipedia. And that, that make your uh, neural network to pretty much understand how the, how the English language is, is working. Uh, sometimes the people are not using the next word. So you can see like if you have such a large corpus of the data that, that you can like waste it, uh, then they instead of like uh, miss, uh, they call it masking. So they mask the words randomly and, and then they are trying to like guess what are those masked words. Uh, okay, so once you have this um, model that is pre-trained on, uh, on, on the large corpus, you have some, your data set that is much smaller and this very similar way you, you basically fine tune the model 
to your smaller data set. What, what's kind of interesting is that you don't have to like end up with the uh, language modeling, like what we have seen, but your response, uh, your dependent variable could be again classification to something totally else. Like in a minute we will see uh, the sentiment. So you see the movie or uh, uh, the movie review or, or general some text and, and the sentiment could be the positive or, or negative. People like the movie, people hate the movie and you are trying to predict that, which almost seem like, you know, if, if computer is able to do that, like then it can do anything. And actually it really appears that like many uh, tasks that have seen like the sci-fi just a few years ago is, is, is now being uh, done with the neural network, like I don't know, text summarization or coming with the label for the images or you know, whatever. Uh, and uh, so one of the, one of the uh, papers that, that started this transfer learning was a uh, ULM pitch paper is from the same authors as the fast AI. Uh, so it's like very well implemented in fast AI. And it's, I believe it was January 2018. So, you know, this is not a distant history. Basically we are now on the, on the area of the active research. Uh, and what's like pretty nice about that is that it's pretty simple, it's pretty small, it's something what you can run in your colab. Like if you look at this recent algorithm, like for this text generation I've mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago, GPT-2, GPT-3, they spent millions of dollars just to like train them. So, so you can't do it as sure as an individual, you can't do it as a small company, you need to be Google, Facebook, Microsoft, something like that. Okay, so how do you have it is working? So it's trained on some large corpus. So if it's text, it's Wikipedia and you can choose the Wikipedia of your language. So for example, I did that on the Czech language. Uh, if, uh, you, if you have the genomic sequence, then it's not so obvious what should be the corpus. But I think, for example, the genome is pretty good corpus and it's pre pretty large. And you are doing the next token prediction. So basically the language model. Then you have some specific problem, like you have, I don't know, several classes of the genes or several classes of the genomic sequences. So you then fine tune your language model to these classes of the sequences. Uh, and, and finally, uh, you do the classification. So now it, it should understand kind of like your language and uh, it's, it's learning the classification tasks. And because it's un like has some uh, deeper view into like how your sequences are working, then this classification like works better. And we will see it in, uh, in a short while on, uh, in an exercise. I just, this is something that I found today on a Twitter, uh, just to show you that it's like coming to our, to our area because it's starting to do ULM fit is, is NLP project. It, it was trained, sorry, it was trained on the Wikipedia. But if you look, uh, I actually, uh, uh, working with the QSR models, but if you look at the name, it, it should resemble you the ULM fit and, and it's basically, it's the paper is about applying the ULM fit model into specific subfield. Okay, so let's go to our final example. Uh, which is sequence classification. And the idea is no matter whether we will do the text or, or the genomic sequences, we basically have several classes. Uh, for each of those classes, we have some training examples and we are trying to train the classifier. So let me start, run anyway. So 
Mm, for the text, we will be using IMBD data. I don't know how many of you have been on the IMBD uh, website, but it's, it's movie reviews. So the users are telling each other whether they like or don't like the movie. So, uh, and our classification problem is to, uh, is to decide whether the movie is positive or negative, which is not much useful for the IMDB, but you imagine that you have Facebook and people are leaving comments on your, uh, on your face, uh, company Facebook account, and you need somehow easily see whether those comments are negative or positive to see overall sentiment. Okay. So uh, we have the train and, and validation set. So just the validation test is called test. So we need to call it. Okay, uh, the data set is, is not so small. So it's like taking some time. Let me see how much time. Okay, when I'm seeing, seeing how much time is taking, I would suggest if you panels agree, to like skip the running and just walk everybody through. Yeah, I think it makes more sense because yeah, and we, we will have, have that much time. Yeah. Because it, it's not like really bring you too much. You, you will just yeah. like see. So, so then we will use the text classifier learner that we have already seen. You do the fine tune. And then you can do the prediction. So you can see that if you try to predict that I really like that movie, then it's not so much difficult. You have positive as a prediction with uh, probably with like 99.79. Uh, if you put there like, oh my God, that was horrible, then it's like really bad. Uh, but just to emphasize, it's, it's not human intelligence. Like if, if you try to track it, you probably do. Like the best movie I have seen, no, definitely not, is clearly negative review. But because, uh, you know, this sentence sounds like somebody's talking about the best movie he or she uh, had seen, uh, then it's uh, predicted as, as positive with, with pretty like high confidence. So, so this is uh, just to keep in mind that those systems are, are not perfect, are probably not substitute for human in many domains. Uh, let's do it for the genomic sequences. I, I was looking, you know, with those uh, examples, the trouble is uh, I need something that would be feasible that where the data would be not like too big, so I was just downloaded uh, uh, 10,000 intergenomic sequences, uh, the same kind we have seen before, so it's like 200 base pairs. And then I have downloaded some um, sequences from transcripts. I believe it's only the parts that are really being translated, transcripted. Um, yeah, I should have checked that. Uh, so, but. But basically, it's two kinds of genomic it's, sequences. It's only, it's only exons, right? It's only protein coding. Yes, it's exons. only protein coding genes. OK. OK. Why it's taking? Yeah, because it's still working here. So I'm going to stop it here uh, and continue here. No. Intelligent. Oh, because uh, by accident I put here the um, the commenting. Uh, I made it the comment, so I don't know how I did it. But okay. So uh, now we have like two data sets, and we need to split them into the training and validation. So again, chromosome one is for validation; the rest is for training. And we need to put it into the right folder. So there is the train uh, subfolder, valid subfolder, and each of them is then like divided between intergenomic and transcript. So this will like make the structure for us. 
we are using the tokenizer, the same kind uh, that we have used last time. Okay, so this is not really needed. Uh, we are now processing the data the same way as, as we do for the text. Taking some time because now our data is four times bigger than they used to be. Okay. So you can see that the, this is our like the input and what we are trying to get as the output is either intergenomic or transcript. Uh, so we create a model, very important thing, like one of my uh, usual mistake is forget pre-trained equals false because otherwise fast I see the text classifier learner and it will give you this Wikipedia trained, pre-trained model. But the Wikipedia is not much useful for the genomic sequences. Okay, this is just a learning rate finder. And maybe I can, oh, maybe I can run it, it's not so. Okay, before it will like um, see the learning rate, we can like continue uh, further. So again, we, are, we have our learning object so we can fit, uh, fit one cycle. And okay, here we go. This is nicer. So 10 to the minus, so I would, so it's suggesting uh, this is really, really small. I would rather do something bigger. So one to the power of minus three seems more reasonable. Okay, and now we like, uh, so, so this one suggested learning rate, this one will do the one cycle. And, and now, you know, you, you can have some fun with, with the model. So, uh, I tried some obvious examples when even I can say whether it's uh, intergenomic or, or looks intergenomic or, or looks like the real gene. So if you try to put in something like that, it's, it's clear intergenomic. There is like no doubt. Uh, this is the beginning of the first exon of my favorite gene, PRDM9. So uh, you can see that that no, that it's pretty sure that it's a gene. And you know, I can, I should play Triske and go to the ensemble and get, get some uh, random gene to prove that those are not like selected uh, examples. Panos, what's your favorite gene? Um, go for uh, uh, TDP forty three. TD P forty three. Forty three. Forty three. Okay. I don't see it. I see some is a form. It's okay. You can get that. Yeah. You know, I can. One of those. Oh, Jesus. So many transcripts. Right. Just pick oh. the first one. Yeah, the protein coding. Or, a, or anyone, yeah. it doesn't matter. I need to, it, it needs to be protein coding to have it comparable. Let's, let's get the sequence. Oh, here it goes. Okay, so let me, I don't know. Put something, no, that's not what I want. It's right there. Something in the middle. Okay. 
And if I go back to my collab, that needs to, no, oh, my collab is still working, but let me put that here. Okay, and in one minute, we will have the answer. Um, in the meanwhile, are there any questions, Panos? I have a question, actually. Yeah. Uh, do you think that if your tokenizer was using, since these are coding sequences mm -hmm. that use a, you know, three nucleotide, um, like triplet thing, mm -hmm. right, for coding, do you think that if your tokenizer wa was length three, could that improve, uh, for example, the, the accuracy of this? As a, you know, like, I mean, yeah. I know you can test it, obviously. But you know, the, the now, thing what would be for sure. Just as a question, mm -hmm. would that make sense? Like, like what I have seen done and uh, what I want to do and I didn't it yet is uh, trying like the bigger cameras because it will be running much faster. Mm -hmm. like, basically do, doing the embedding trick because if we do, it base pair by base pair, then we have only four categories. Right. While if you use camers of the lengths three, four, five, maybe even six, you yeah, have, three, you know, have, like you have dimension limited, yeah. you can't afford, right. but you can do the same trick as for like English. Right. And, um, okay, so there are some questions uh, from other people. What's the size of the sequences? Uh, I think it's 200 nucleotides, if I remember. It's 200 nucleotides for the training. Yeah, so it's not, it does, it's not big enough, quite big enough to contain a full gene, but no. it's a big chunk of the gene. Um, is there a way to exploit the trained models to understand the features used to classify the data? So this is interpretation of the model uh, and provide a better point of view of, of the data to exploit in research. So this is a question about how can you interpret the, the, what, what type of things the model, what features the model learned uh, so that you can then, you know, uh, go back and, and, and use that in research. That's um, an excellent question. Uh, and, yeah. you know, you, you panos know that this is something what we two taught a lot. Uh, right. Like in, in the past few weeks, because we have tried, so, so the, um, the um, easy answer is yes, uh, but it's hard. Like it's mm -hmm. not like on the silver plate. You need to uh, you need to try a bit. So what the people are doing a lot is is like looking on the first layer of the neural network when it's like easy and, and you basically have something like the motifs in the in the first layer that that's easy. Right. What they do is that they are taking the sequences. And they they do like small perturbation, like they change just one nucleotide, and they see like what it will do with the response of the neural network. Mm -hmm. like, like then the conclusion could be okay. So if I perturb the first nucleotide, it does nothing, and if I perturb something in the middle, then it's more sensitive. You know, right. Or you can you can start uh, you can start changing. Uh, change the number of nucleotides, for example, in this example, uh, and see when your transcript starts looking like an intergenic region. Uh, this means that these nu specific nucleotides were more important or, or, or something like that. I, I guess in this example, it doesn't make that much sense, but um, yeah, for something else, it could. But yeah, the, the interpretation is the hardest part, I believe, in this, uh, in this field because um, after a couple of, especially if you're not working with the images where you can, you know, kind of see things, um, like what does a third layer of a uh, convolutional neural network based on sequences mean? You know, it's like, it's some abstract, two layers of abstraction from the sequence and it's really hard to like understand uh, and, and explain as a human. So yeah, we, we are definitely, I mean, we're actively working on this too, and I think many people are, but it's an open field if you're interested. And it's also important because I would say it's the most frequent uh, response from the reviewers we are getting. Right. Like, 
yeah right. it's, it's nice that that you attain this accuracy but why right. like or that's what's, that's what's, yeah. what's biological insights your exactly. model it's like you can you can predict things better but we don't know why so does it really matter that you can predict things better yeah. that's the that's a big thing yeah okay so that worked so the the transcript a little bit worse but yep you got yeah, 80% exactly. so, about so at least we've, we've got the transcript we can discuss like why i wonder let me try if i delete those like g's <laughs> In a row. Oh, no. no, actually, it didn't work this way. So my story was not working. Okay, so this is everything from like main topic. We have uh, a few closing slides. We have the books, or those are uh, my books, books that I like. I, I would reiterate about this fast AI book that just appeared 10 days ago. Uh, it's really important if you are watching the course, like uh, this is, uh, they, they did it like three times before, but this time with the book, it was like much easier to go through the course because otherwise, you know, you, you forget what they tell and you are uh, browsing YouTube videos and it's, it's a hell. Uh, you can read it um, for several months uh, for free on the GitHub. So if you are not sure whether the book is good for you or not, then look there. Also, uh, the whole book is basically Jupyter Notebook. So you, it's, it's not only for the reading, but you can run it and, and like modify it. Uh, so this is about the fast AI. Uh, there are other frameworks we um, didn't talk today. Uh, and uh, the, the main competitor is TensorFlow and the Keras. And uh, the remaining, or, or those two books are about the TensorFlow and the Keras, especially deep learning with Python. If, if you are uh, somebody that is coming to this field, like this one is awesome. I, I've never seen the book that would, with so like good explanation even for the, for, for the people that are not so into math and, and machine learning. This one is more practical and uh, this, is the old, uh, this is the old version. There is, there is new addition. And the last one is if you are a mathematician and you are interested in the theory that is behind it all, this is the classic that you probably should read. Uh, there are plenty of courses on the market. Uh, the fast AI, obviously. But uh, the TensorFlow is having a YouTube channel with many awesome videos, so like 10 minutes, the, the small tutorials. Uh, there is the Kaggle that is traditionally a, a server for machine learning competition. But honestly, for me, those days, I was more looking for uh, the data sets and, and the people with uh, Jupyter notebooks and those data sets because like why to reinvent the wheel when many people already did that. Uh, there are machine learning crash course that was originally developed for the Google employees and now it's publicly available. And that there is of course uh, Coursera and other machine, uh, massive online courses, but, but Coursera specifically with, with the Andrew Ang and machine learning specialization is I believe I believe also that course, the older version, maybe two years old, it's on YouTube for free. They have it on in yeah, uh, yeah. Stanford website. If or, you don't need the certificate, then, then right. Yeah. Uh, just a small reminder: what you have seen today uh, is is just. Uh, a fraction, what do you need to do deep learning and practice? We didn't talk about how to uh, run your models, how to put it in the production, how to monitor them because you train them with some quality, but will the quality will be the same like uh, two years from now and so on. So so just, just a small reminder then, then it's like, it needs a little more work to make it actually useful. And, but even after that, like this is the joke that was on, uh, on my favorite uh, comic site, XKCD, I believe something like 
six years ago. And the joke is about it. It's like, it's very easy to know on the, on the photo where it was taken because there's the GPS coordinates, but it's almost impossible to see whether the photo is of a bird. And so it was seen impossible just a few years ago. On today, it's something that we have all learned in less than three hours. And that's my final conclusion that the world is changing. And finally, it's our first time uh, we are doing that. So I, I know the organizers will uh, be sending some uh, feedback forms. We would be really grateful if you like, you know, help us uh, identify what are the weak parts, what are the good parts, what was nobody understands and so on. And thank you all for coming. And I would say also, if you if you have, I mean, we can we we still have about fifteen minutes to discuss any questions. Uh, but I would say also, if you if you think that you might have any um, idea, any problem that could be solved with with this type of uh, of um, approaches, we're always looking for collaborators or people that you know have interesting problems. So feel free, you know, we're, we're really open with that. Send us an email and we'll discuss it. And if, if something, you know, pans out, we're always open to, to check out different fields or anything, or even help you with your, uh, with your research if you want. So really, it's no problem if you, if you just shoot me or Peter an email and, and you know, we can see if uh, something comes out of it. Um, okay, so yeah, Peter. No, no, I just wanted to say that alternatively, we are on the um, Twitter and you can find our emails on the university site if they are not right. like, distributed through the conference. Uh, okay, so we have a few minutes. So um, let's discuss a little bit some of the questions we left. Um, okay, so maybe some more examples of what kind of biological questions one could answer with uh, with this type of uh, uh, with this type of methods. Um, so I don't know. From my side, what I would think. Uh, I mean, you have the obvious kind of classification questions, like what Peter showed, like. Uh, you, you, if you're looking, uh, for example, to annotate a genome with where are the, you know, where are the genes or the promoters, uh, classifying non-coding RNAs and coding RNAs, exon syntrons, three UTRs, etc. These are kind of questions where you can learn, you can, you can um, get publicly available data, uh, learn how do these things look compared to each other. Uh, you know, create a model like a classifier and then go back and start scanning some regions to, to annotate. Um, uh, for um, what we've done and what we're working on kind of in the lab is, uh, for example, we, we have used the convolutional neural networks so the first uh, things we showed you uh, to identify small RNAs, small RNAs in the genome, uh, looking uh, in, in like scanning large regions of the genome to find uh, pre microRNAs or SNO RNAs and, and other small RNA types. Um, this was interesting also because we figured out that you could train a model in one organism that is very highly, like very well annotated. And then you can take this model and, and use it in a completely different organism to scan uh, there and find uh, as long as the, um, what you're looking for is similar enough, not necessarily the same, but you know, it has a similar structure. You can, um, you can do cross pieces, annotation like that. Um, I don't know, any, Peter or anybody else, any other ideas about things you can do? Yeah, I, th I think you basically summarize it. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh... Like many of those things are not 
kind of specific uh, specific for biological data if you do i don't know plant recognizer you basically have like images recognizer and right from images yeah and apply it to the specific data like uh, an interesting one is um uh this uh, artificial sequences for example right uh making making sequence that look like or produce sequence that look like real sequences uh, that you can uh, then use for better backgrounds uh, when you're doing uh, motif recognition or something like that. Um, you can use it for binding, uh, to identify binding sites, for example, for uh, microRNA target prediction or uh, RNA binding, protein binding sites, transcription factor binding sites, anything um and the other thing is that we showed uh sequences now but another big thing uh people are using is the especially when we're talking about rna uh secondary structure and how things fold you can use that as well as a feature um and you can use also evolutionary conservation as a as a third thing and and combine all this together for example to to get more information out anyway the the i think there's lots of uh there, there are many things you can do the the bigger issue for me is to have a data set and the question like to have a question and the data set that goes with it um and the and the actual machine learning part is hard, but the, having a good data set is probably harder because at, at least we can usually not do experiments, uh, so we we are kind of um, constrained by yeah. publicly available data sets. Um, yeah, okay. No. If we have no other questions, we should probably like thank everybody. Yeah. We, we yeah. Should we should do it we should thank uh to our helpers because we have like oh yeah definitely more people uh uh carla uh vlasta david and ondra that that were answering the question finally uh it, it when i'm going through that it uh, didn't it doesn't look that there was were so many technical questions which honestly is one of the first maybe the first uh, tutorial I'm teaching when we had like no technical emergency, like uh, <laughs> half of the collapse aren't working or, or something like that, which is really good. Um, also, Peter, how are we sharing the, the slides for the, so, so the uh, slides, it will be on GitHub, right? Everything yes, will be on GitHub, right? The slides already are on the GitHub. Okay, so great, great. Go great. to the GitHub that you were like, running all of the exercises on the first line you have the slides and you have the link uh, to view it in the google doc and uh i, might I believe there are some other resources if i will have time yeah and i guess if you go that that's also our, our lab github so if you go one level up you can see different projects we're working on yeah. Uh, that use uh, like in real action how these things uh, look when you actually develop things. Um, not everything is uh, public, but uh, the things that are finished uh, should be published. Uh, public. Um, okay, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think that's everything. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to turn it. Okay, <laughs> maybe we should wave. Like, yeah. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.